Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What a wonderful day this is. What a beautiful day this is. The 4th of July. It's time for fun and celebration on this great day. All right, we're going to have some fun, and we want you to join in and project, and I'll tell you when. Thanks for joining us on this very, very special occasion. The National Archives, let me tell you a couple of things about the National Archives. Of course, it is the permanent home of the Declaration of Independence. For more than 31 years, it has hosted a patriotic ceremony here on July 4th to celebrate our independence. This is the kickoff event for all of the patriotic activities in our nation's capital during the morning hours, the afternoon hours, and of course, tonight. After our ceremony, we invite you to stay right here, stay right where you are, and enjoy the National Independence Day Parade right here on Constitution Avenue. And this evening, of course, the National Symphony will perform a Capitol Fourth live concert from the U.S. Capitol, followed by fireworks on the National Mall. So stay around, enjoy the day, stay cool, drink plenty of water, wave those fans, and enjoy and celebrate our Independence Day. Now I ask you, those of you who are seated, to please rise for the presentation of the colors by the 3rd United States Infantry Old Guard Continental Color Guard with Michelle B. Johnson singing our national anthem. stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the Or the 
And now to give us this taste of the atmosphere of colonial America, we have with us the 3rd United States Infantry Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. Their uniforms are from the era of the Revolutionary War, and so is their music. And I am pleased to present Specialist Phillips to narrate their performance. Please join me in welcoming the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The United States Army Military District of Washington, under the command of Major General Michael Linnington, is proud to present the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. The first mention of an American Army musical organization is contained in a reference to the celebration held after Ethan Allen and his Green Mountain Boys successfully captured Fort Ticonderoga, a British stronghold in 1775. The organization which performed at this celebration was a fife and drum corps. The 3rd United States Infantry Regiment, the Old Guard, traces its lineage back to George Washington's original Continental Army and today serves as the Army's official escort to the President of the United States. In 1960, the fife and drum corps was organized to participate in official ceremonies and to revive our country's musical heritage. The Corps performs for visiting dignitaries and heads of state at the White House and throughout our nation's capital. In addition, the Corps travels extensively, averaging nearly 500 performances annually while serving as a goodwill ambassador for the Army across the nation and abroad. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps.
The history of the fife, bugle, and drum is one of the most vital aspects of early American military life. In an era before electronic devices and in a place where timepieces were uncommon, the military field musician played a crucial role in communication. The sounds of these instruments acted as the voice of the commander, signaling to the soldiers when to rise, how to move in battle, and when to retire for the evening. Traditionally, the most skilled drummer was given the title a drum major and was designated to lead the musicians. Today, the drum major who stands before you continues this tradition by wearing the light infantry cap and issuing silent commands with the espontoon, an 18th century weapon. The soldiers of the Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps play modernized versions of traditional field instruments. This allows the corps to perform more contemporary arrangements than the music found in manuscripts of the 18th and 19th centuries. Listen now as the corps features the fife, bugle, and drum, bringing to life the sights and sounds of our country's musical heritage.
Throughout the history of the American Army, one of the most significant duties for the field musician was to render honors to the flag of the United States of America. The Corps will now play music from the retreat ceremony, an occasion where the flag is lowered, signaling the end of the duty day, and then conclude this performance with the signature melody, Yankee Doodle. Gentlemen, the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps. <laughs> On behalf of the Old Guard Commander Colonel David Anders and the Fife and Drum Corps Commander Chief Warrant Officer Frederick Elwine, it has been our pleasure performing for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Specialist Phillips and the Fife and Drum Corps. And we're just getting underway. You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you, all of you in fact, have memories of how you have celebrated the 4th of July, our Independence Day through the years. As a youngster growing up in East Tennessee, our town of Kingsport held an Independence Day parade every year, as many towns and cities, large and small, have done and are still doing all across this great land. But I must say that none of those parades really, nor are gonna be as large or as colorful as the one that you're going to see today, right here on Constitution. During my broadcasting years, I spent about eight years as a news correspondent overseas, much of the time in France, where our Independence Day is noted each year because French General Lafayette fought under George Washington and helped us secure our independence. And when Allied forces landed in France at the outbreak of World War I, General Pershing and his American troops returned the favor to France, saying on landing on French soil, Lafayette, we are here. You can celebrate the 4th of July anywhere, of course, in the world that you are, but isn't it nice, especially nice, to be here in our nation's capital on this day for the celebration. Thank you. 
You know, the National Archives works every day not only to preserve the actual Declaration of Independence, but also the ideals that it defines. As the National Archives cares for the records of our democracy and, very importantly, makes them accessible to the public, they also help ensure the rights of individuals and the accountability of government that is the hallmark of our democracy. Now I'd like to introduce you to a very important person to whom our nation has entrusted the care of the Declaration of Independence. He is also responsible for 10 billion pages of records, that's 10 billion. Along with his staff, he is the one who decides which of those millions and millions of documents that the federal government produces each year are saved and become part of the written record of our nation. Mr. David Ferriero is the archivist of the United States. He was sworn in as 10th archivist of the United States on November 13th, 2009. Previously, he served as the Andrew W. Mellon director of the New York Public Libraries. Before joining the New York Public Libraries in 2004, Mr. Ferriero served in top positions at two of the nation's major academic libraries, the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies in Cambridge and Duke University in Durham. Mr. Ferriero earned bachelor's and master's degrees in English literature from Northeastern University in Boston, a master's degree from the Simmons College of Library and Information Science, also in Boston, and he served in the Navy during the war in Vietnam. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States. Good morning, and thank you all for coming to the National Archives on this, the 235th anniversary of the day the Continental Congress adopted the Declaration of Independence. As you may know, the Continental Congress actually declared independence from Great Britain on July 2nd, but didn't adopt the Declaration of Independence until July 4th. A few weeks later, Congress ordered the Declaration written on parchment, and on August 2nd, most of the Founding Fathers reassembled and signed it. That's the same document that we have here inside this building. And that was just the beginning of the Declaration's journey. During the Revolution, the Declaration was rolled up and moved from city to city as Congress moved to avoid capture by the British. When the British were burning Washington in 1814, First Lady Dolly Madison asked the State Department clerks to wrap it up in bags of linen for safekeeping outside the city. First, they hid it in an unused grist mill near Chain Bridge in Virginia, then in a private home in Leesburg until the war was over. During the 1800s, the Declaration was on exhibit for long periods at several locations in Washington, where it was exposed to sunlight, fluctuating temper temperatures, and humidity, all of which took their toll on the document. Finally, officials took note of the effects of the aging and wrapped the Declaration and stored it flat at the State Department, where it joined the Constitution. And in 1921, President Harding signed an order transferring both documents to the Library of Congress. Just after Pearl Harbor and the United States' entrance into World War II, the library sent the Declaration and the Constitution to Fort Knox, Kentucky for safekeeping, and they remained there until September 1944 when they were returned to the Library of Congress. Finally, in 1952, the documents came to their rightful home here at the archives. The transfer occurred on December 13, 1952 with great pomp and circumstance as well as highly security as the newly encased Declaration of Independence and Constitution would car was, were carried up these steps into the rotunda. And the Declaration of Independence was safe until 2004 when the good treasure hunter, Nicholas Cage, <laughs> cleverly stole it during a party in this building. Stole it to protect it from the evil treasure hunter. Our national treasure was miraculously and circuitously restored to its rightful place and now poses the most oft-asked question in the rotunda, can we see the back of the map? B back of the, is there a map on the back? And I can tell you for certain that there is no map. 
Only the words original Declaration of Independence dated 4th July 1776, nothing more. There is a mystery, however, on the front of the document. The lower left-hand corner has the distinct handprint. Whose we do not know, but we're looking for early and very early photographs to at least determine when it first appeared. So spread the word and help us solve that mystery. Although the traveling days of the Declaration are over, the spirit of the Declaration continues on today. Soon you'll hear the words of the Declaration of Independence read aloud by our honored guests. And being here today makes you part of the Declaration's journey. After our ceremony, we invite you to come inside and see the Declaration. You can also enjoy our family activities and exhibits, including our newest exhibit, What's Cooking Uncle Sam? that shows the government's effect on what Americans eat. Now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Chief Justice Royce Lamberth. Royce C. Lamberth was appointed United States District Judge for the District of Columbia in 1987 and became Chief Judge in 2008. He served as a captain in the Judge Advocate General's Corps of the United States Army from 1968 to 1974. After service at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and in Vietnam, Judge Lamberth served in the litigation division of the Office of the Judge Advocate General of the Army at the Pentagon from 1971 to 1974. I've had the privilege of hosting two naturalization ceremonies in the rotunda, and just Judge Lamberth administered the oath both times. Please welcome Judge Lamberth. In 1776, America's founders gathered in Philadelphia to draft the Declaration of Independence, which dissolved the political ties that had bound the American people to Great Britain. A new nation was thus born, free and independent, the United States of America. Eleven years later, in 1787, after American patriots had won our independence on the battlefield, Many of the men who had met earlier in Philadelphia, plus others, met there again to draft a plan for governing the new nation, the Constitution of the United States. In 1789, after the plan had been ratified, the new government was established. As a United States District Judge, it is my sworn duty to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land, the nation's fundamental law. But the broad language of the Constitution is illuminated by the principles set forth in the Declaration of Independence. To better understand and appreciate the form of government we have, therefore, it's important to look first to the Declaration of Independence. The Founders' immediate aim in the Declaration was to justify their decision to declare independence. Toward that end, they set forth a theory of legitimate government and then demonstrated how far English rule had strayed from that ideal. But their argument served not simply to discredit English rule. In addition, it set the course for future American government. Indeed, for more than two centuries, the ringing phrases of the Declaration of Independence have inspired countless millions around the world. Appealing to all mankind, the Declaration's seminal passage opens with perhaps the most important line in the document. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Grounded in reason, self-evident truths invoke the long tradition of natural law, which holds that there is a higher law of right and wrong from which derive human law and against which to to criticize that law at any time. It is not political will then, but moral reasoning accessible to all that is the foundation of our political system. We are all created equal as defined by our natural rights. Thus, no one has rights superior to those of anyone else. Moreover, we are born with those rights. We do not get them from government. Indeed, whatever rights or powers government has come from us, from the consent of the governed. And our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness imply the right to
to live our lives as we wish, to pursue happiness as we think best by our own lights, provided only that we respect the equal rights of others to do the same. Drawing by implication upon the common law tradition of liberty, property, and contract, its principles rooted in right reason, the founders thus outlined the moral foundations of a free society. Only then did they turn to government. We institute government, the Declaration of Independence says, to secure our rights, our natural rights, and the rights we create as we live our lives. But the powers government may need to do that must be derived from our consent. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution together address mankind's most basic political questions. Resting on a form moral foundation, they were meant to serve not simply the 18th century, but generations to come, which would face those same basic questions, whatever their particular circumstances, whatever their state of material progress. Because the principles the founders articulated transcend both time and technology, they will serve us well as we move through the 21st century, if only we understand them correctly and apply them well. In the end, no constitution can be self-enforcing. Government officials must respect their oaths to uphold the constitution, and we, the people, must be vigilant in seeing that they do. The founders drafted an extraordinarily thoughtful plan of government, but it's up to us, to each generation, to preserve and protect it for ourselves and for future generations. For the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution will live only if they are alive in the hearts and minds of the American people. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Lambert. Well done indeed. Let us now listen to the words of liberty as we read aloud the Declaration of Independence. And for that, I am happy to introduce to you a very distinguished group of people who will read the Declaration of Independence. First, we are very pleased to have with us today two very special guests. Gentlemen, if you would stand as I call your name, defense man for the Washington Capitals, Jeff Schultz, one of the top players of the National Hockey League. And I would also like to introduce another special guest, Gregory McCarthy of the Washington Nationals, Vice President of Government and Municipal Affairs. And I think you got a game today with the Cubs, if I'm not mistaken, with... Uh, Go Nats. All right. Good luck. And next, to read the grievances against King George III, we have three of the leaders of the Second Continental Congress. We have with us, and this is very exciting, Mr. Thomas Jefferson, Mr. John Adams, and Dr. Benjamin Franklin. These three gentlemen know the words of the Declaration better than anyone else because Mr. Jefferson wrote the first draft. Mr. Adams and Dr. Franklin uh, made changes to it, and they seem to be getting along fairly well. Finally, to read the names of the 56 signers of the Declaration, we are happy to have with us Private Edward Ned Hector, free black colonial soldier, respected patriot and hero of the 3rd Pennsylvania Artillery Company. He was noted for his courage during the Revolutionary War when he refused to let his team, wagon, and armaments fall into enemy hands. He is quoted as saying, the enemy shall not have my team, I will save the horses or perish myself. Ladies and gentlemen, the Declaration of Independence. In Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, 
becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the, pol the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal stations to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A, descent, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is a right of the people to alter it or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall see the most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurp usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation until his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasion on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected, whereby the legislative powers, incapable of annihilation, have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states. For that purpose, obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. 
He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislature. He has affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, <laughs> for, <laughs> for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is, at this time, transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation and tyranny, already begun with circumstances scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages, and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity and have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce 
and the necessity which announces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is that is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may have right do. And for the support, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you, gentlemen. And again, I apologize for interrupting the Declaration of Independence there. How stirring it is to hear those words just as they were written 235 years ago. Private Hector will now read the names of the colonies and signers of the Declaration. In colonial times, it was customary to show one's approval by loudly shouting, Huzzah! So now, after Private Hector reads all the names of the signers from each state, we must shout out our approval. But let's practice a hearty huzzah on the count of three. One, two, three, huzzah! Well, I'm afraid some of you folks would be sent to England after that. that. Let's try it one more time. One, two, three, huzzah! Well, that was good. That was great. Private Hector is going to read all the names from each state, and then we will shout our approval. Private Hector, please read the names of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Sir, by your leave. First, to the Honorable John Hancock, President of this Continental Congress. New Hampshire, Joe, easy, easy. New Hampshire, Josiah Bartlett, William Ripple, Matthew Thornton, huzzah! Massachusetts Bay, Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Gary, huzzah! Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins, William Ellery, huzzah! Connecticut, Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, William Williams, Oliver Walcott, Huzzah! Georgia! <laughs> Button Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, George Wharton, Huzzah! Maryland! Samuel Chase, William Paker, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll, of Carrollton, huzzah! Virginia! George Wythe, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson, Jr., Francis Lightfoot, Lee, Carter, Bl Braxton, huzzah! New York, 
way employed. Philip Livingston, Francis Lewis, Lewis Morris, Huzzah! Pennsylvania! What? Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, and George Ross. Huzzah! Delaware! Good. Caesar Rodney, George Reed, Thomas McCain, Huzzah! North Carolina. Indeed. William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn. Huzzah! South Carolina. E Edward Rutledge, Tom Thomas Hayward, Jr. Thomas Lynch, Jr. Arthur Middleton, huzzah! And New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hopkinson, John Hart, and Abraham Clark, huzzah! And this is attested to by the Secretary, Charles Thompson. Together we say, Huzzah! 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 Now briefly, I would like to thank some of the people who helped make this year's July 4th celebration possible, the Foundation for the National Archives, our special guest readers, Jeff Schultz and Gregory McCarthy, the American Historical Theater and our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Ben Franklin. Nice of you to stop by today. And our representative of the Continental Army, Private Ned Hector, the 3rd United States Infantry Old Guard and Drum Corps, and the Colonial Color Guard, Dykma, We'd also like to acknowledge Mr. Jim Gallagher and John Hancock Financial for their continued support of the National Archives July 4th festivities. And of course, we wouldn't have this celebration without the hard work of the staff and volunteers of the National Archives. And I want to thank you very personally for joining us in this commemoration and in the celebration of the 235th anniversary of our Declaration of Independence. I wish you all a wonderful 4th of July, and we hope that you will stay and take part of the festivities later this morning, this afternoon, and tonight. And to conclude today's program, please welcome back Michelle B. Johnson to sing America the beautiful. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountains, majesties. See? 